In this lesson we will focus solely on the concurrent stack and we will do it in a bit different style. So first we will try to find some solution, then we will go through a specific problem and then finally we will see how the real BCL based concurrent stack solves this problem. Let's move on. A general stack looks like follows. There is a head or you can call it whatever you want. There is a single reference or a pointer for unmanaged languages that points to a specific first top node. This node contains some value and on the other hand it has a pointer or a reference to another one, one level lower. In this case we have three values in the stack. You can see that the final value has null in its next field. So that means that once it's popped up, the stack will be empty. The very same rule is applied to a, like a general construction of a concurrent stack. Basically it has a single head and then it is followed by a linked list of nodes. Every single node holds the value and the pointer or a reference to another node. Before we dive into algo and the problem, let's recap the interlock for a while. The first and foremost interlocked uh, provides us methods to do read, modify, write, meaning like read the value, for instance, increment it, and then write it back in an atomic way. So every single interlocked, uh, whether it's compare, exchange, exchange, increment, decrement, add, is translated to an assembly log that logs a specific CPU cache line for x86 architecture. Again, there is a specific overload meaning interlock compare exchange that can work with references. So if you create a class, for instance, node class, you could come up with the idea that uh, I can use interlock compare exchange and then just swap the references atomically. Having this said, we could think that, yeah, hey, potentially, maybe we can even implement our own version of a concurrent stack. So let's do it. Our own concurrent stack will have some differences. The first, it will be named just a stack, that's just a naming difference. But next, the push and pop methods will accept a node object. So they that's a bit different from the BCL concurrent stack because for the concurrent stack uh, that is provided with .NET, it accepts the value, the generic type parameter T for push, uh, the same for pop. We do this kind of change just to observe one behavior. You can think of it like, okay, if we were implementing it in a bit different way and we were accepting T value, then we could use some kind of pool or a cache of four objects that could just store the node and reuse it over and over again. Basically, what we don't want to have in here is like additional allocations for pushing the object on the stack. So. From these two choices, either accepting node or having a kind of like a pool for nodes, uh, I just made this one and we will accept node for push operations and we will return a node for pop operations. So again, it's a really simple algorithm. We just accept the node, set the next to the head and then in a loop, we will try to do interlock compare exchange. Why do we use a loop? Because there might be another thread that wants to access the head and swap the value. So the algorithm works as follows. We read the head, store it in the next, and then we try to replace head with this new node. Once we are done, we know that the push happened. If we are not done after one spin, we need to spin again. Again, for a regular, like a healthy production ready code, we would put some spin weight in here and probably we would just write one if uh, that can check it at the very beginning without going into the loop because we might be um, in a case that there is no that much pressure put on the specific stack. So if we push, if we have head A as you can see in the lower example and we push B then head will point to B and B will point to A with its next field. If we push again C, we will have head set to C, C will point to B and B will point to A. That's just a regular stack. You just push on top of it 
and pop it. The pop operation is quite similar. Uh, we are using uh, two variables in here, node and next. So first we will just read the head to node variable. If it's null, we will return null. Basically head points to nothing. There is nothing in the stack. We will just return null. Otherwise we will remember next because in the last line, we will try to interlock compare exchange the head with the next. And that's basically the, the popping behavior. Once we are done and we succeeded, we know that the node that is stored in the node variable, that's the right node that we want to return. Again, that's like try to swap till you make it. And again, for production ready code, you'd put probably if at the very beginning and provide some spin weight to do not starve CPU. Let's take a look at the second example that just represents what pop does. So if we have head uh, being set to C and C points to B, B points to A, if we pop, it will return the node C and then the head will point to B, which points to A. If we pop again, it will return B and head will point to A. And if we pop again, it will return A and head will be set to null. Every other pop will return null unless uh, another third, another worker pushes something to our stack. So far, we know a lot. We know how to use interlock compare exchange. We know that we could use some kind of pooling, but we will just return and accept node objects, hoping that the caller will be will do the pooling for themselves. So now we are prepared to validate our approach. Consider the following scenario. We have two threads um, that run the very similar operations. They, they try to pop and push values onto the stack or from the stack. As always, a thread execution might be interrupted in some way. So we can think of these interruptions. I don't mean the hardware interruptions, but the interruptions in the threads execution. We can inject these kind of interruptions to see how it will work. So let's move on. At the very beginning, the head points to A, A points to B, B points to C. We have stack with three values, A, B, and C. In the left column, you can see execution from the thread one. These are the operations that are executed by thread one. In the second right column, you can see that there is a thread two. And we will use this kind of temporal navigation that whenever there are no dots, the other thread is being executed. So let's move on with our popping of A uh, in the thread number one. As you can see, we are reading node, that is head, and that is A. Then we read next, which is B, because A points to B. And then we are interrupted. Let's move on to thread two. At the beginning, thread two tries to pop A as well, because it, it, it reads head, which is A, it stores it in node, then it stores B in next, and it does the compare exchange on the head. It succeeds because there is no other worker currently doing the compare exchange. So we are moving further. Now we will try to pop B. I mean, the threat itself doesn't know that the B will be the result. That's the outcome. So we are reading head in here, B, uh, that is stored in node, uh, C, that will be the next, and we will do the compare exchange. So compare exchange, again, that's the uh, operation that exchanges the head and it sets it to C if the previous value in there was B. And again, there is no other worker, it will succeed. Thread number two does the final step. So it wants to return A again. So what it will done, it will just say, Let's push A, there is no other worker, so we succeed. So now we have a head that points to A and A points to C. The very next operation that is executed is actually interlock compare exchange. So the only condition that we were using before, it is comparing it with the previous value of the head. So what will thread one do 
is it will again try to execute interlock compare exchange, it will pass the reference to head, it will pass the new value b because that's the next that it remembered and the condition will be whether the head is equal to a. But now the a was stored by the push from the thread too. So the interlock compare exchange, it will be executed and now head points to b. We just lost c, we don't know where b points and this problem is called aba problem. The aba problem name comes from the following observation. We observe a, then we observe b and then we observe a again, but it means something else. It's also called sometimes ABA prime problem because the second version of A, even if the reference is equal to the first one, it means something else. In our case, it was the, the result was that the, the following operation or the following node after A, it was C, it wasn't B any longer. So that's the ABA problem. If we have a problem, probably there are some solutions. So the very first solution is to do not reuse nodes. Allocate node on every single push. Whenever you push, just allocate a node. And this will ensure that interlock compare exchange will work because new references, uh, they are never equal to previously created objects. So every single time you allocate on push, it will ensure that, the, that there won't be this false equality with the interlock compare exchange. Of course, it puts some pressure on GC, but that's one of, of the solutions. The other solution is based on so-called tag references. Because the address or reference is really long, if you use uh, eight bytes for storing the, the, the address or reference, you have some place in there, some space in there that you can use for counting. And tagged reference uses the, the, the leftover space in a reference or a pointer for doing some counting. That ensures that interlock compare exchange, even if it compares the same object, it will fail on comparing the counter uh, part of the reference or a pointer, and then it will basically do not swap the values. The other version of it is to use just uh, 16 bytes long compare exchange. Then you can put a reference and a counter uh, just right to each other, which will be 16 bytes long, and then issue the compare exchange. Unfortunately, this method is not available, uh, it's not provided with the interlock compare exchange. There is no overload for it. The last solution, a really fancy one, is to use fancy data structures like intermediate nodes or uh, hazard pointers. These solutions are really fancy, um, a bit more complex and require a lot of uh, rework and uh, properly defining your data structures. So in .NET, concurrent stack uses the first option. So it will allocate a node on every single push. On pop, it will just get the node and leave it for gar garbage collector to collect it during the garbage collection. So if we revisit the push operation, we can see that for the concurrent stack, it will just allocate the node and try to do the swap. There are two operations in here, like I mentioned, the fast path, the first, which basically tries to do if interlock compare exchange, if this succeeded, we are happy to return. If not, we are going into the like a slow mode, which re is represented by push core, and it does the, the loop with spin weight, with some retries, and properly uh, using the spin weight, mentioned spin weight structure to do not starve CPU. The pop operation, uh, it, it just pops the node, and as soon as it's popped, it is just left for garbage collection. So actually there is not that much to see in there. So let's sum up what is concurrent stack then. That's a thread safe stack implementation, basically last in, first out. It's based on a single linked list of elements. We have this head, head points to an element, that points to another one, to another one, and finally the last one points to null. 
it has this kind of lock free adding there is no locking in there but this requires some gc because we are allocating objects after all and the last two methods um, that are worth to mention push range and tripop range these methods are optimized for range operations so whenever you want to push multiple items it's always better to use push, push range because it will create the list up front and then it will swap the head uh, in an atomic way only once if you push with for each for instance for each item push 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 it will require multiple oper interlock operations which again uh, puts a lot of pressure on this data structure and may be harmful for the overall performance of your application after bringing up the summary let me bring to the table a few more considerations so for instance you may you may come up with the idea that the concurrent stack is a perfect uh, data structure for for a pool of objects because once the object is pushed on the stack we can pop it and it's warm because we know that it's in CPU cache. So that's a really good behavior and really good property for a cached object because then it can be reused again. From the other side, uh, if we use it frequently, there is a lot of pressure on the head. There is a single field that is operated on. So we constantly do the interlock compare exchange head this might bring a lot of pressure for your application so the final step as always do a lot of benchmarking and especially a real case you may write an app you may try to write a benchmark but do something and measure it before you decide what to use